Police are warning about an armed gunman on the run after shooting up a local bar. City leaders in Fargo consider liquor sales in grocery stores. Plus, the plan to get the COVID vaccine to underserved communities in Minnesota. Valley News Live at 10 starts right now. This is Valley News Live at 10. An armed and dangerous man is on the loose in Fargo tonight. Police say if you see this man, 43 year old Brandon Grant, do not approach him and call them immediately. He's no stranger to law enforcement. Grant was the center of an hours long standoff back in September 2019 near NDSU. He was sentenced to just under a year in jail. Meanwhile, bar bartenders tell us that Grant was also banned a long time ago from the Bismarck. That's where police say he shot three people early yesterday morning, leaving these bullet holes behind. According to investigators, in the past eight months, they've responded to the Bismarck more than 600 times. That has one Fargo City Councilman concerned. This is a repeated offense. This is something that happens again and again. Uh, and so there's something happening here that's that's more than just a bar being downtown. Other bars downtown don't have these things happening. Commissioner Tony Gehrig sent out an email today saying that the Bismarck and the Empire Tavern have been given unlimited chances and the owner should not have a liquor license. Fargo isn't ready for beer and alcohol to be sold next to the food you buy. A proposal tonight would have dropped the 100-foot rule, which, as it stands now, requires any liquor sales to be 100 feet from the entrance to grocery stores. Valley News Team's Aaron Walling joins us live from City Hall with the very latest. Aaron? Thanks, Mike. Commissioner Tony Garrick had two topics he wanted to discuss at City Hall. One was about the Bismarck and Empire Taverns. However, that motion was denied at the start of the meeting. Now, in regards to the 100-foot rule, which would entail allowing possibly of having alcohol sold at grocery stores, well, that motion was also denied as no one else seconded it after he brought it forward. Now, there were discussions afterwards about allowing the Liquor Control Board to put forward a recommendation and a review before they go forward with any more proceedings. Commissioner Garrick gave his reasons during the discussion on why the rule should be removed. One, the law is quite arbitrary. Uh, two, uh, the reason it was put in place really I don't think is a concern anymore. No one wants these things to be in, in gas stations. And three, it preempts future business. So I know that people want to see a study and they want empirical evidence, but there's no empirical evidence, not with anything. Um, what I'm saying is that if there isn't a good reason to have a law in the books, that law shouldn't remain. Uh, and at this point, there is no good reason for the 100-foot rule. It's protectionism is what it is. As of right now, as we said earlier, the commission is possibly waiting for a discussion from the Liquor Control Board on what to do as they go forward with proceedings. Back to you guys. Thanks so much, Aaron. Still no answers in West Fargo after someone shot out the windows of a tattoo shop. It happened in the overnight Friday at the Shades of Grey Tattoos. No one was inside the building during the time of the incident. If you know anything, you're asked to call police. The owners of an, RB's, an RV business in Detroit Lakes say that a December arson fire and theft of a new fish house could wind up costing a million dollars. The fire was at Wold's RV sales and today charges were filed against a 42 year old man. Amy Wold says while the business hit a big bump in the road, they are still operating. I just want everybody to know that we're still in business. We're not going away. We, we are a family owned business. We have 11 employees. We we are, I mean, we're here to stay. <laughs> the man charged in the case is Daniel Kaufman. Police were able to connect his truck to the fire and theft and also found incriminating internet searches on his phone. If convicted, he faces up to 20 years in prison. These warmer temperatures are bringing snow back into our forecast. The weather team has declared tomorrow a first alert weather day as we may be dealing with some tricky commutes. Let's head straight over to Hutch now for finding out what's going to happen when we wake up tomorrow morning. Hutch? Well, the good news is we are expecting to stay fairly mild as we go in and through our Tuesday. However, snow for some of us will cause some travel difficulties. Here's the latest on your first alert weather day on Tuesday. First and foremost, we do have a winter weather advisory for the Highway 2 corridor from the Devil's Lake Basin through Bemidji. And also it does extend down the I-94 corridor for Jamestown through Fargo and into Lakes Country for Detroit Lakes and Wadita counties. We are expecting a narrow band of snow to develop and the best chance of seeing some significant accumulations of two to four inches 
with isolated amounts up a little higher in a few spots will be right near Highway 200 and Highway 2 in that corridor and trace to the south, a trace to the far north. Today was lovely. Temperatures, as mentioned, reached the 40s for some. I'll have details in hour by hour forecast fashion and what you can expect for our tricky Tuesday weather coming up here in just a minute. All right. Thanks, Hutch. You bet. Less than 15% of the population in Minnesota has received at least one dose of the COVID vaccine. Reporter Charmaine Nero explains how some health care workers in the state are working to make sure the vaccine becomes more available to some communities across the state. As of Saturday, 13.7% of Minnesota's population has already received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. And doctors and staff at Alina Health are working to make sure available vaccines are getting to people in communities that may be disproportionately affected by the virus. We are seeing some disparities in, in the uptake, and I think that's for a variety of reasons. Vivian Anuguam is a health equity manager for Alina Health. She says the hospital group is leaning on data to address disparities. There is opportunity to improve access to the vaccine and to show up um, in the community where folks um, live and work. Recent analysis by the Kaiser Family Foundation shows a pattern of black and Hispanic people receiving smaller shares of vaccinations compared to their shares of cases in deaths. We are working with our diverse uh, community leaders, whether it's virtual trainings or just having our providers out there um, talking to community. Most recently in Philadelphia, the Black Doctors COVID Consortium put on a 24-hour vaccination clinic, prioritizing zip codes with a population disproportionately affected by COVID-19. I think that is a good example of the need. And yes, there's hesitancy, but there are also folks that want the vaccine, right? While Anugwam says Alina Health is working daily to address those disparities, she says the goal is to make sure there's equal access to the vaccine. We cannot ignore equity or overlook equity um, by focusing solely on speed. Alina Health says it's continuing to track its own data on who is getting vaccinated. While the country waits for the latest on the status of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, the company says they're ready to go. They put out a statement saying they intend to distribute the vaccine to the federal government immediately following authorization, which could happen on Friday. They're expected to dole out 100 million doses to the U.S. in the first half of this year. The vaccine doesn't use the same mRNA technology as Moderna and Pfizer's, but rather it's a viral vector vaccine. Experts say the method has a proven track record. It's constructed like traditional vaccines that we've had in the recent past. The vaccine is also easier to store and transport. Plus, at least for now, you will only need one shot instead of two. And here's an easy way for you to stay on top of the latest COVID vaccine related information. Just use our VNL vaccine tracker. You can visit our website or simply open your phone camera and point it at the QR code on your screen. Then tap the link that pops up. North Dakota's House has endorsed a measure that would prohibit local governments from mandating face coverings. The bill also bars making a mask mandatory as a condition for entry for education, employment or services. The bill's sponsor and others argue that there was no proof that masks work to slow the spread of the coronavirus and they question the government's role in mandating them. The bill now goes on to the Senate. North Dakota's Senate has decided for a second time to allow the state legislature to meet annually instead of every other year. Senators voted 28 to 19 today to approve the bipartisan measure. The bill was amended to allow the legislature to meet annually if they choose only over the next two years. The bill now goes to the House where its future is uncertain. Lawmakers have rejected attempts to hold annual sessions for decades. Minnesota Governor Tim Walz plans to spend more than $518 million on projects to maintain existing buildings and invest in communities across the state. It's part of his local jobs and projects plan. He says it's time to start investing in the infrastructure and not wait any longer. I'm going to make the case to them that, that now is a good time. It's, it's smart. These are investments across the state of Minnesota. And as you said, and I think I would ask folks out there to think about that, um, you're not saving money not replacing that leaky roof. You're not saving money. Um, and you're also, and sometimes you're actually putting things at risk. Um, and, and they depreciate, or worse yet, they become hazards. 
Some of the projects included in the governor's plan, including housing infrastructure bonds to preserve and build new housing opportunities across the state, as well as rebuilding efforts in the Twin Cities in areas damaged by civil unrest last year. President Biden's $1.9 trillion COVID relief bill will go before the House for a vote. The House Budget Committee voted to advance the legislation today. The package includes $1,400 checks to Americans making less than $75,000 a year, an increase in the child tax credit and aid to small businesses. The bill could go to the House floor for a vote later this week. Life-changing experiences on another continent. Still to come, meet the young boy who went in search of wishes with your help. Today, 48 in Gwinter, 49 in Jamestown, and we soared into the 40s in Grand Forks and Fargo as well. Well, most of us enjoyed it, but summer snowbox snowman here, not so much. This guy may be happier with the forecast, which includes flakes. Your details are coming up next.